Ultimate Fighting Championship is opening up 2021 with a couple of major events. This past Saturday saw the beginning of the promotion's venture with new broadcast partner ABC, and the UFC on ABC era got off to an auspicious start with a sizzling main card topped by an all-timer of a performance by Max Holloway against Calvin Cater. Next Saturday, of course, is UFC 257. The first pay-per-view of 2021 features the return of the sport's biggest star, Conor McGregor, as he rematches Dustin Poirier in the main event with former Bellator superstar Michael Chandler, set to make his long-awaited Octagon debut in the co-main. In between those two milestones, there is another card. An unloved, neglected middle child by the name of UFC on ESPN 20, or UFC Fight Night, Chiesa vs. Magni, if you prefer. And that middle child, which takes place Wednesday, January 20th at the same Etihad Arena, is a big one, with 14 fights scheduled. The main event between fringe contenders Michael Chiesa and Neil Magny is intriguing, and there is a scattering of divisionally relevant fights throughout, as well as the debuts or returns of some interesting prospects, but in many ways this card feels like a grab bag. Good evening and welcome to the SureDog Radio Network preview for UFC on ABC1. That is not the name of this card. I need to stop copying and pasting my notes. Good evening and welcome to the SureDog Radio Network preview for UFC on ESPN20, Chiesa vs. Magni. I'm your host, Ben Duffy of SureDog.com, and with me is Keith Schillen, executive producer of the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network, as well as a writer for SureDog.com and a host and creator of numerous shows for SureDog Radio, including the Schillen and Duffy Show. Keith, how are you doing this evening? Man, I'm doing great. I'm still kind of buzzing from yesterday's action when we saw a once-in-a-lifetime performance of Max Holloway. I don't expect to have anything like that on this card. Uh, but who knows? Maybe we will. I think you described it perfectly, though. It is the middle child. The, it's it's This is a hardcore's dream. This is for the hardcore fans that will watch all 14 fights. Like Even the main event is geared towards hardcores because, yeah, Neil Magny, Michael Chiesa, they're both really good fighters in the division, but they don't have like any that like marketability in them. Their styles, they're not... You know, they're not fan favorites. They're just kind of guys in the division that don't get people excited in the most excited division in MMA or one of the most excited divisions. This is strictly for hardcores. Uh, not a lot of relevance in the rankings. And then you add in the fact that it's, you know, we're on the East Coast. Or I mean, I'm on the East Coast. I think you're Central Time. It's very early morning for me. It's even earlier morning for you. It's midweek. It's just just strange all across the board. It's I agree. It's it's super strange. Uh, you're right about there being a lot of good stuff here for hardcore fans. Like Michael Chiesa versus Neil Magny is a fight that I didn't know I needed this fight until they said I was getting it. As soon as they announced it, I mean, I don't think Michael Chiesa versus Neil Magny had ever escaped my lips before, but as soon as I heard that they'd made the fight, I was like, I love it. And you're you're right in that they're a, a hardcore fan's delight. They're, it's not a, an exact parallel. It's not exactly the same, but both of these guys remind me of how I would have thought of uh, Jorge Masvidal like five years ago. Like, sure. his fights are appointment viewing. You're not sure if he's ever going to break through into like the top five or top ten because – you know, he's always liable to lose a fight in just kind of a, a weird flat way or get a bad decision against him at any time. But for as long as he's in the sport, he, he's the hardcore fan's dream. Both of these guys have a little bit of that to me. So just to recap, what you're telling me is Neil Magny about a year from now is going to be one of the biggest stars in the sport. That's exactly what you just said, correct? That is exactly what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> Or is, oh. it, or is it or is it or is it or is it Michael Chiesa? Is that the one who you're saying was going to be the star? I'm not predicting either thing, but if it's one or the other, it's Chiesa. He has a little bit sure. of that that sharpness and wit about him that uh, that Masvidal does. I mean, Masvidal was a fantastic soundbite long before he said, you know, super necessary or you know, three piece with the soda. He was always a hilarious interview, and and Chiesa's got a little bit of that too. There you go. You have it there first. The uh, next BMF champ is going to be Michael Chiesa. He will be uh, SureDog's Breakthrough Fighter of the Year for 2021. You heard it here first. 
Yeah, that I, I don't know about that. That but wraps up again, the show. That wraps up the show. We can just can't yeah. <laughs> be all done now. <laughs> all right. Uh, this card originally was scheduled to have Leon Edwards versus Kanzat Shamayev on it. Do you care that that fight got bumped? Um. Yeah. I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm sad to see you know two of the best guys in the world fighting, and that that definitely makes more sense during the McGregor week. You know, Leon Edwards, a guy that's near the very top of the division, one or two fights away from a title shot. You got Hazat Shamayev, who is one of the rising breakout stars of 2020, you know, coming to 2021. The the only thing that really, really still doesn't make sense to me is that Wednesday, like, I it would make more sense on a Friday, like how they do the, you know, we used to get the Friday, Saturday, one year we actually had, a, I think it was a Thursday, Friday, Saturday build up to a card. Like, that would have made more sense to me than the Wednesday. But uh, I'm nitpicking here. Maybe they're just trying to get this card out of the way before McGregor gets off the plane and, like, throws something through a window. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I want to throw something out here, and I want to do it before we start getting into the fights because it's something that will come up as we go through the fights. Uh, This, in some ways, feels to me like our first look at what the UFC is going to look like in year two of the COVID era. Because, you know, once they they started back up in May of last year, basically every card was characterized by fighters stepping up and debuting on short notice, everybody getting signed off the Contender Series, basically, and cards just being liable to be being shaken up at the very last minute because of COVID. You know, it it was the year of new faces. Year two... Okay, there are 28 fighters on this card. Eight of them did not fight at all in 2020, including four people making their debut. There are four fighters on this card who are making their UFC debuts who did not fight at all in over a year. Yeah. How, how do you, I mean, how do you scout somebody that hasn't fought since October of 2019? It- or... If if you were on a three fight winning streak, but the last fight was fourteen months ago, do you have momentum? Well, it's the same thing we just talked about a couple of days ago with Santiago Ponzinibbio. Now, I'm, and, and and that's to the extreme. That was the guy who was in the you know top ten, top fifteen rankings when he left. And it was still like we were saying, you know, we both ended up picking him to win, but we both said, like, I'm worried picking this pick because we haven't seen him. I think about a guy like. Um, Dion Draj, who's on this card, like he hasn't fought a ball two thousand. 20 mike davis hasn't thought and then some of the guys that you get making their debuts they're making the debuts on like they get signed this week uh so that is something that is going on and then of course just the big expanding card we have 14 fights like i remember the time it was five fights you tuned in it was five fights and (laughs) and that's it now then they went to eight and we're like oh my god and there was you know to have 14 fights but it kind of is necessary because you know Chances are two or three fights are going to be canceled off this card. So now you get down to your 11, you know, give or take here and there, and you have your normal size card. I'm kind of still expecting that here. Right now we have 14. We're, we're filming this late sun, Sunday night, so we're, you know, not less than 72 hours. We're actually, because it's early morning, we're a little over 48 hours. So this looks like we actually might get 14, but you might one or two cards – one and two fights probably still get canceled. Uh, give me your guess. How many fights take place at Etihad Arena on Wednesday? Well, I'm, I'm going to go with the two. I'm going to say two gets canceled. Oh, sorry. Takes place 12. I'm going to say okay. two gets canceled. Not two, not two fights take place. Um, I'll say 12 simply because we're only two days away. Sounds good. I'm going to go with 13. Uh, we'll circle back and, and put that in with the rest of our predictions. Speaking of which, let's dig into this. We have a women's flyweight fight between two debuting fighters in Victoria Leonardo and Manon Fioro. Leonardo, 30 years old, is 8-2 and two as a professional mixed martial artist. Uh, she'll be fighting for the first time in the UFC. She made her appearance on Dana White's Contender Series last November, uh, knocking out the much-piped and, and quite favored Chelsea Hackett in the second round. She'll be taking on Fioro. Fioro is a 30-year-old French woman who is 5-0, and sorry, 5-1 and in her mixed martial arts career, also making her debut. She fought uh, most recently last November for Abu Dhabi Warriors. 
Right now, Fioro is actually uh, slightly favored, minus 175, where Leonardo is available around plus 155. Uh let me throw this one to you first, Keith, just because I know you did uh, quite a bit of tape study fairly recently on Leonardo as well as Hackett. So uh, what's your take on this one? Uh, so I'll start with, with Leonardo. The first thing that jumps out to me is the fact that you said her opponent is a negative 175 favorite. That's just like just the ongoing narrative with Leonardo, where she always kind of seems to be the underdog, always con constantly counted out. She's got some really good experience. I know this is her UFC debut, but her experience has been on Invicta. Also, you just mentioned the contender So she's coming into the UFC pretty seasoned. Her two losses came to Miranda Maverick and Aaron Blanchfield. That's two of the top prospects in all of women's MMA. Two girls that, I mean, obviously Miranda Maverick is in the UFC doing well, and I'm sure Aaron Blanchfield's phone will be rang sometime in 2021. Uh, Leonardo is not a great athlete, but she kind of makes up to it by just being so physically strong. I mean, she is a brute. She's flat-footed. I described her on the Dana White Contender Series as a boxer who throws kicks, not a flowing kickboxer. Uh, she wants to throw down in the pocket. She she kind of looks for an overhand right. She kind of looks for it a little too much, kind of chases the KO instead of just letting it come to her. But what I, why I mentioned the kicks is she throws a lot of the kicks, but they're, they're round-winning kicks. They're not really damaging kicks. She throws a teep. She throws a push kick, a high kick. She's just kind of scoring points with them, and that's why I'm saying she's more of a boxer who throws little kicks. That's what I meant by that. She has some big defensive holes on, on the feet. She keeps her chin high in the air. He keeps, she keeps her head on the center line. She doesn't really check leg kicks. Uh, and she does much better when she's moving forward. As she kind of likes to play the bulls, she doesn't really, uh, she doesn't really do well with someone who can match her volume and kind of foster off on her back foot. Her clinch is her best position. This is what I think is her biggest strength in the UFC is because she get in there, she grind, she use that, that just physical strength to her advantage, and she does very well to kind of dirty it up with uh, dirty boxing elbows, uh, shoulders. She'll hit the shoulder, stuff like that. Uh, she'll take the fight to the ground. She has some decent entries. She's hard to take down herself. And, uh, she's got some good ground and pound. We saw that against Chelsea Hackett. And another thing that's a really big strength for her is her cardio, which is surprising with someone who has, you know, a woman that has so much muscle for her to kind of be able to fight uh, deep into the fight. Now, move over to Manel Ferro. Uh, Ferro, I think I'm saying that correctly. Uh, my French is, is not that well. I haven't seen like tons of tape study. This isn't my contender series preview where I'm doing five fights and trying to go deep on them. Uh, but what I saw, she's southpaw, good movement, good footwork. She got some quick hands, some nice pop on her strikes. Uh, she does make the mistake of sometimes throwing one punch at a time, which could be a huge problem going against a girl like Leonardo, who kind of works off a of volume. That could be a bad way to lose rounds. Throws a lot of kicks, also likes teep kicks, a lot of push kicks. So I think we're going to see a lot of kicking battle in this matchup. And she will add in some takedowns herself with her striking. Has some nice entry, good top control, heavy pressure. So as far as a prediction, this this is a hard fight to pick right out right out the box. Both fighters, I think, are good additions to the UFC roster. I think they both, from what I've seen, look like UFC level fighters. Leonardo has you know the big you know, big fight experience advantage. And she's more UFC ready at this point in her career. However, I think uh, Firo has the higher ceiling. And I'm going to take her based on that. I think she's going to stop some takedown attempts from Leonardo. I think she's going to uh, land some of the cleanest shots on the feet. And I think she's going to win a unanimous decision. So I'm going to go with Firo by unanimous decision. Well, all righty. Uh, for Saturday's card, it took quite a while for there to be any dissension between us, but we're going to have some disagreement right off the bat on, on this one. Uh, I like Leonardo in this one. And like you, you know, I'm pretty limited on what I've been able to find on Manon Fioro. Uh, but coming up as she has through uh, EFC and, you know, Drikas Duplessis aside, he's like the only like decent UFC level fighter I've seen come through EFC. It's just, it's not a high level uh, promotion at this point. And the fighters that she fought there were like, you know, one and oh, one and one uh, type fighters. And then through uh, Abu Dhabi Warriors, which is definitely a second tier promotion for that part of the world, it's not 
brave CF. Uh, I don't think she's really fought anybody at Leonardo's level or the level of most of the women Leonardo has fought. The one exception being Leah McCourt, who is a very good prospect and beat her. Uh, I can see Leonardo having success in this fight in some of the same way she did uh, against Hackett. You know, against Hackett, someone who uh, wants to kick, wants space and time to kind of uncork her offense. Leonardo just kind of crowded her and kept moving forward and just basically squashed her offense. I can see her doing the same against Furo. It'll be interesting to see who's the stronger woman when they, like the first time they lock up, the first time they clinch. Because, yeah, Furo is a is a big flyweight, uh, but Leonardo just... She's very strong and powerful herself. I think a lot of it will hinge on that, but I am going to go with the more known quantity and the more tested fighter, which is relatively speaking, both of these women made their pro debuts just in 2018. But give me a Victoria Leonardo by decision. We move to the men's bantamweight division where we have an interesting prospect matchup between two debuting fighters who, as uh, mentioned off the top, actually didn't fight last year at all. So it's fighters being... Uh, signed off of film and, and reputation, and in at least one case, off of name value. It is Umar Nurmagomedov, cousin of the recently retired UFC lightweight champion, taking on Sergei Morozov. Nurmagomedov is 24 years old. He is 12-0 and as a professional mixed martial artist and has appeared all over the world, but primarily in Fight Nights Global, uh, with a couple of appearances in Professional Fighters League as well. Morozov, the 31-year-old uh, Kazakhstani, is 16-4 and four in his mixed martial arts career and has spent a good amount of his time in uh, M1 Challenge, where he is on a five-fight winning streak dating to October of 2019 when he avenged an early career loss to Josh Reddinghouse. Currently, Nurmagomedov is the highest uh, favorite on the card, sitting around minus 500 with Morozov available around plus 400. Keith, is that line appropriate, or do the odds makers think that Khabib Nurmagomedov is going to walk in there and punt a bantamweight halfway back to Kazakhstan? Yeah, so that's the first thing that jumped out to me. Uh, obviously, before I did film study, I was like, oh, yeah, Umar is going to win this. This is a showcase fight. Then when I did more tape study, I was like, this line should be a lot closer than than it is. Now, uh, I guess I'll show up my hand. I'm taking Umar to win, but I think he should be more... I still think he should be a pretty lengthy favorite. Probably negative 300, not the biggest one favorite on the card. I think both guys are good additions to the UFC. We'll start with Umar. Obviously, he's, as you mentioned, he's Habib's cousin. He'll have Habib in his corner. He's more elusive than Habib on the feet. Now he's still his hands are are still pretty limited, but uh, he fights from both stances. He's light on his feet. He throws a lot of kicks. Like that's his strength on the feet. He almost has like a karate style with his kicks. He he kicks from both legs. He's throwing. Uh, but in the grappling, you get exactly what you expect from someone with the last name Demagomedov. Incredible entries, smothering top control, constant heavy pressure hard ground and pound has five submission wins he has that dagestani style where it's secure the position do the damage then look for the submission like in that order he's not going to be a ronda rousey kind of jumping over looking for an armbar. that's not really his style go over to uh morosov uh he's got 19 professional fights like that's something you got to like heading into the ufc lots of experience he's well-rounded he's light on his feet got some good snap on his punches Nice leg kicks. He mixes punches and kicks together well. Mixes takedowns in striking uh, together well, too. Got some good entries himself, both uh, entries and body lock takedowns. So he can get you from in close or from distance. He does need to improve his top control, uh, though he does, if he, if he does keep you down, he got some good ground and pound, and he has three submission wins. So... Before this fight, I thought the Margamay was going to smoke him. I like Morozov a lot better on film than I expected to. I still think the Margamay was going to take him down and hold him down and, and then eventually find a submission. So I'll give me the Margamay off, but I think it's going to be about third round. Uh, in the third round is when he gets him. Excellent. 
uh, have a, a call between submission or uh, or TKO? Yeah, yeah, uh, submission. Excellent. Uh, you, you've broken down the X's and O's uh, for me. The thing that I'll say was interesting about Nurmagomedov is, uh, yeah, he he has a very, you know, Dagestani style of, of wrestling, but the difference between him and Khabib is Khabib, whether it was, you know, when he was 12 and 0 or when he was 28 and 0, uh, he wanted to strike for as long as it took for him to see his first opening for either, you know, a shot or or a clinch. Uh, I think Umar Nurmagomedov, he he wants to kickbox you, and he just has that wrestling as a safety valve. Like it, it you know, the the skill sets aren't too dissimilar, but the disposition is, is different. I think he's probably going to get the worst of it for as long as he wants to stay on the feet with Morozov. And I think he's going to probably end up needing to turn to his wrestling earlier than later. Morozov has some pop, but I don't think he has enough pop to just ice Umar Nurmagomedov. I, I haven't really seen that out of anything, uh, you know, that I that I've watched. So I have the feeling they're gonna they're gonna do some kickboxing, and he's gonna sting Nurmagomedov with something, and then it'll be wrestle time, rinse and repeat. Uh, you know, especially with the, you know, with Khabib in, in his corner, he he's not going to play with his his debut. He's he's not going to going to risk the loss. So w- once he gets something he doesn't like on the feet, he's going to take him down and then it's going to be rinse and repeat. I think Morozov is tough enough and he's a good enough wrestler and grappler to survive, but I think he's going to end up losing just a, you know, three rounds to nothing decision. We now head to the lightweight division where we have the much awaited arrival of a former two division cage warriors uh, champion. Well, th- the other former two division cage warriors champion who's fighting this week in the UFC, I guess, as Mason Jones, not Conor McGregor, makes his UFC debut. Welcoming him to the octagon is Mike Davis. Davis, the 28 year old New Yorker, is eight and two as a professional mixed martial artist. He is one and one in the UFC, having fought twice in 2019, uh, losing to Gilbert Burns and defeating uh, Thomas Gifford. And then, of course, not having fought in 2020 at all. Uh, Jones is 25 years old. He is a perfect 10 and 0 in his career. And as uh, mentioned a a moment ago, won the Cage Warriors featherweight title before moving up to lightweight and winning. Uh, it's lightweight title, again, much like McGregor. Davis is a slight favorite. He is minus 175, while you can get the debuting Jones around plus 155. Uh, I'll say right off the bat, I I don't think Mike Davis has had an appropriate test yet in the UFC. I, he lost to Gilbert Burns, but for one... Burns was far ahead of Davis in his professional development. You know, and I know Davis like stepped up on short notice, you know, after losing on the contender series, but Davis, a former featherweight stepping up on short notice to fight Gilbert Burns, who not only was about to move up to 170, but would a year, you know, later be one of the top five, 170 <laughs> He's pitchers. fighting for the title. But yeah. Considering that, yeah. He actually looked pretty good. I mean, he was <laughs> sure. on his heels the the whole fight, but he was game and he was there. He wasn't completely trucked. Uh, speaking of completely trucked, his next UFC fight was a contender for beatdown of the year of 2019. Oh, yeah. For those of you who don't remember, he put at least two 10-8 rounds on Thomas Gifford, and there was a round that you could make a case for a 10-7 round. And for me, I, I as a quote unquote official scorer for sure dog have never given out a 10, seven round because generally for me, if it's a 10, 10, seven round, the, the guy probably should have been stopped, but Gifford would have been close. It was a complete mauling. And that was Gifford's last shot in the UFC. So basically he's fought a title contender level fighter and a non UFC level fighter. And then he's been off for a year. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm trying. So I don't want to jump in, but what you're telling me is Mike Davis is somewhere 
his skill level is somewhere between Thomas Gifford and Gilbert Burns. Exactly. Like. He, he's somewhere, <laughs> you know, uh, he is somewhere between the, the fifth and 500th best lightweight on the planet right now, I feel confident saying. Uh, so despite... Uh, Davis having already been in the UFC for a couple of years, uh, Jones is a bit more of a known quantity. And unlike Davis, he's had a very logical run up the ranks. He fought pretty good opposition in cage warriors ending with a first round knockout of Adam Proctor, who is himself a very good prospect and may well end up in the UFC at some point uh, last September. Having said that, I'm going to take the gamble here that Davis is going to be too much for him. I, th based on what I've seen of both guys, I think once they get in there, the speed differential for Davis is going to be alarming. Uh, Jones is a guy who I, I, he presents a, as a striker, but you know, he, he wants to strike and then wants to, you know, clinch and either get his offense in from the clinch or, you know, uh, even bring it to the ground. I think he's going to have a hard time with that against Davis. Uh, Davis has fast hands, fast feet, uh, throws a pretty good variety of strikes and, and has decent uh, footwork. So I, I think the odds are about right on this one. Davis is, is a righteous favorite, though he shouldn't be a heavy one. Again, the, the problem we come back to, Davis is a guy who hasn't fought in a full year. Some guys, when they're 28 years old and 10 fights into their career, they come back and they are a much improved fighter. They've got wrinkles that you you know you wouldn't expect. You know, other times they've plateaued or they, they've even lost a step. You know, there's there's some rust there. I'm going to bank on whichever version of Davis steps in there being too much for Jones right now. But I I do like both of these guys to be pretty good factors in the division going forward. And neither of them has peaked yet, so it's just a sign of how good lightweight is that just the most forgotten throwaway lightweight fight possible is, is a pretty interesting one. Give me Davis by decision. Yeah. I, I love this fight from a talent sense. Like I like both guys. Jones is coming in with a lot of hype, especially from the European fans. They're really excited to see him join the UFC. I mean, that happens a lot when we have, you know, very quality European fighters. I'll start with Davis. I just want to jump off the point that you last said you talked about. We don't know what kind of Davis we're going to get because of the long layoffs. I'm also in that more confident side that you took based on his age. He's 28, so he's at the age where he should be entering his prime years. He has professional boxing and amateur Muay Thai experience. He's well-rounded, doesn't have any like glaring weaknesses. His boxing is really technically sound. He's a pressure counter striker who uses feints very well to draw out his attacks. Excellent head movement, constantly bouncing his head off the center line, making him really hard to hit. You mentioned variety. He has just a large arsenal of strikes. Beautiful jab, good timing on his right hand, very, very accurate. He works the body, mixes in kicks well with his combinations. A good Muay Thai clinch where he does really good. I mean, he was killing Thomas. I mean, he's killed Thomas Gifford with anything you want to do, but specifically the Muay Thai clinch. He he does really good, not just to get the clinch, but to use angles on the clinch. He'll turn it. He'll get like outside of the hip where it really gets you more talk to come up the middle. And he's also really good at like pulling down the head. So when he gets the knee up, he gets actually connected on the head. Uh, but I also love his, he also has a wrestling background. He, he has a very explosive double leg where he drives right through someone's hips uh, will lift you up in the air, slam you, violent ground and pound. Now, move over to Mason Jones. He's a great addition to the UFC uh, roster. I know that's the third fight in the row. We have a newcomer. I've said it. Uh, a lot of people want him in the UFC a long time. He's a, you mentioned the Cage Warriors champs. So that means he has, not only does he have like a lot of experience, but he has good experience. Uh, he's a good striker. He's very, very aggressive. He throws hard. He's, he's, uh, he's a lot different than, Mike Davis in the strike where he's more of a brawler than a, than he, than a technician. Uh, but that actually might be a good thing against Mike Davis if he can turn it into a firefight, make it into a, a you know, not a not a distant striking bout, but a, you know, in the pocket throw down and see whose chin holds up. That's kind of uh, would be really good thing for Mace, uh, Mason Jones. Uh, nice thing and jab. He's got a really good slip and rip right hand. Uh, does does very well to bob and weave his way into range, throws combinations, good power. Um doesn't really use his wrestling enough, but he—I he, I wouldn't say he's a wrestler, but he can get it to the ground, and he has some solid ground and pound if he does. Uh, but he really wants to keep it on the feet. But he does have two submissions on his record, which is actually good too. 
This is my favorite fight on the entire card, including the main event. Uh, this is a this could, if this stays on the feet, this would be a really good uh, stand-up affair. I like both guys. That said, I'm also taking Mike Davis. I think he has such a speed advantage, but he also has a wrestling advantage in his back pocket that if he gets cracked by Mason Jones, he could turn into a wrestling. So I'll give Davis a unanimous decision. But this is also my pick for fight of the night. I think they take home 50 G's each. Men's flyweights take the octagon next as the debuting Francisco Figueroa brother of the UFC flyweight champion, takes on Jerome Rivera. The younger Figueredo, 31 years old, 11-3-1 with one no contest as a professional mixed martial artist, will be taking on the 25-year-old Rivera. Rivera, a New Mexico native, is 10-3 in his mixed martial arts career. He is 0-1 in the UFC. Uh, having made a short-notice debut just uh, six weeks after his appearance on Dana White's Contender Series and been punched out by Tyson Nam in the second round of their fight. Figueredo is a slight favorite as of now, sitting around minus 145. Rivera is available around plus 125. Keith, who do you like in this one? Um, (laughs) I Figueredo, I will say this about him. He's coming with a lot of pressure, being that... You know, his brother is the champion of the division and also most websites fighter of the year. So not the best time to come in. Uh, obviously, there could be a lot lofty expectations on you. He is not his brother. Uh, he's not the same level athlete. He's not as explosive. That says there is things I do like about him. He's a southpaw who switches stances. So he kind of fights from both stances. He's a pressure counter striker, similar to uh, Mike Davis I just mentioned. He's pretty accurate with his strikers. Not a lot of tells. He doesn't – this is actually something he does better than his brother. He doesn't load up on everything. He throws um, from where his hands are, so he doesn't really uh, telegraph as much as his brother does. But he also doesn't have his brother's power. Um, In fairness, no flyweight in the world has his brother's power. Uh, He works behind a jab. Um, He has a really good short right that he landed a couple times. I wish he'd throw it more. Because uh, when he steps in his bri- in his range, he's similar to his brother, where he wants to throw lots of hooks, trying to end the fight. Um, but he does a little different than his brother. I like that he attacks the body, and um, he has har- hard kicks to the body too. So it's like whether it's punches or kicks, he's kind of constantly attacking the body. And then he also does a step in knee, which you know I, I always get excited for that. Uh, he, he also, speaking of knees, he likes to throw a flying knee to close the distance, something that we talked about Calvin Cater likes to do. Uh, two major holes defensively, though, is he keeps his chin high in the air and he drops his hands, something that his, bro- his brother drops his hands to. He will sneak in a takedown, but he's not a, he's not a great wrestler. Most of his takedowns come from catching kicks, uh, though he is a good uh, BJJ pr- practitioner. He's got seven submission wins on his record. Not the best defensive wrestler, but he does have a good get-up game, similar to like his brother. Uh, and he does fade late, which is a big problem considering he's coming down in weight class, which makes it even more troublesome. Now, I said all this stuff about him, and I said he's not his brother, and then I spent the entire time comparing himself to his brother. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> exactly how I told people not to do. Um, Jerome Rivera, a, a guy that came off the con- contender series, I'm pretty familiar with him. He, he's just so tall for the weight class. He's 5'10", flyweight. Uh, he's an okay boxer, but nothing spectacular. He kind of dives into his strikes, kind of overreaches sometimes. Um, doesn't still kind of learning how to keep his distance. He leads with his chin a little bit too, making him very hittable. I like his kick game though. He throws keep kicks up the middle. He's got a good clinch game, good plum kinch, good knees. He does well to like frame and kind of create space to land like a slicing elbow and stuff. Weak defensive wrestler though. And um, when he gets up, he he'll like he'll give up his back to get up, which is obviously the higher level you go, that's going to become much more of a problem. Uh, though he is an okay offensive wrestler, like he'll get some some takedown himself, some solid top control. He'll look to advance to position, and he's a legit submission threat. He's got seven career submissions himself. Um, and another thing is he's got some good cardio, which uh, he really builds up as the fight goes on. So. I think this is a really evenly matched fight. I like Figueredo early. I like Rivera late. 
So going with that, I'm really kind of on the fence. I ended up eventually picking Figueredo, though. I like I like his wrestling takedowns. I think he can sneak some of those in, um, especially when his opponent kicks, and that's such a big part of Rivera's game. So that might actually might limit Rivera's kicks. Uh, he's going to have to avoid the clinch, though, because if if Rivera gets that plum kick, he can do some serious damage. So I'm going to take Figueredo. I think it's going to be a really close fight. So I'm going to say Figueredo by split decision. Outstanding. I see a lot of the same dynamic you do. And yeah, this is definitely a case of there are two brothers in MMA and they even physically look very alike, but their game is only similar in very broad strokes. Uh, there are some cases, I mean, you look at Anthony Pettis and Sergio Pettis, they, they look identical other than size, but their games are very different, but they're still both very, very good fighters. Uh, this is a case where they look very similar and their game is similar in just broad strokes. But I'm I'm with you in that Francisco is just not the same level of fighter. I, I see the same dynamic here that you do. I like Rivera a lot as a, a prospect. I liked him on his appearance on the Contender Series, even though I actually thought it was kind of iffy that he got the decision in that fight. Yeah, I'm not sure he won that fight. But if he got some injustice there, he made up for it by taking a short notice uh, fight against Tyson Nam at Bantamweight. And... For a guy who leads with his chin and who has gotten through his career to this point just by kind of weathering his opponent's offense rather than defending against it, that was a gruesome matchup, and he got knocked out just like you would expect him to. There's certainly the possibility that Figueredo could do that to him, but I'm I'm with you. I favor Rivera late, but I favor him late even more heavily than you do. Figueredo hasn't fought in over a year, and off of not fighting for over a year, he's dropping to flyweight for the first time. If he's anything like his brother in this regard, it's not an easy weight cut, and it took uh, it took Davis and Figueredo a long time to get that dialed in to where it's not a problem anymore. Uh, Francisco's at the beginning of that process. I, I I see Figueredo winning the first round, maybe even having Rivera in some trouble. Rivera starts to roll downhill as this thing goes on, and give me Rivera by submission in the third round. I think he's just going to find Figueredo exhausted and either knee him to death in the clinch or it goes to the ground and Rivera will find a way to choke him out. But give me Rivera by submission in the third round. The UFC on ESPN 20 prelims power on with a middleweight contest between Dalta Lungiambula and Marcus Perez. Lungiambula, the 35-year-old from South Africa, is 10-2 and two as a professional mixed martial artist. He is 1-1 one and one in the UFC having won his UFC debut against Daquan Townsend in June of 2019, then lost via a knockout of the year contender uh, front kick from Magomed Ankalaev in November of 2019. And he is uh, yet another of the eight fighters on this card who did not fight at all in 2020. He is dropping to middleweight for the first time. He'll be taking on Perez. Perez, the 30-year-old Brazilian, is 12-4 and four as a mixed martial artist, Two and four in the UFC. He fought once last year, losing to Drikas Duplessis by a first round knockout in October. Lungiambula is a slight favorite right now, sitting around minus 130, where Perez is available at plus 110 or so. Uh, now, I know I'm saying this right after I talked about how I don't believe in Figueredo, you know, dropping in weight off of a year off. And now I'm about to pick Lungiambula in the exact same situation. But there, there's a lot about Lungiambula's game that reminds me of Sokaju. And not just because they're both dreadlocked African guys, you know, even if one is from South Africa and one's from, from Cameroon. But they're both guys that they have judo black belts, but they really just want to knock you the hell out with haymakers. And their like monstrously muscular upper bodies hide the fact that they were kind of undersized for their division. Because of that, I actually like the idea of Lungiambula dropping to middleweight, even if it makes me nervous that he's doing it for the first time off of, you know, uh, off of a, a year off. And just in a lot of ways, we won't know what he looks like, but if he is anything like he was in his first two UFC appearances, I mean, if he's even 75% of that, if he makes the weight and doesn't pass out on the scale, this is a miserable style matchup for Marcus Perez. 
Uh, like I said, Lungi Amala just wants to take your head off. Uh, Perez's head is there for the taking. He's a good grappler, uh, you know, be, and he, he has a few tricky weapons in the stand-up, but he is defensively porous in the stand-up. He's hittable. His chin is not great. I hate to sound like the UFC hype man where it's just he only needs to find that chin once, but literally he just needs to find that chin once, and I think he will. Unless Lungi Ambala is, like, shivering inside the, like, the shower curtain or towel thing at the weigh-ins and falls over, give me him by first-round knockout. Yeah, so I actually thought it was the other way around. I thought Perez was moving up a weight, but no, you're right. According to the UFC website, it's the other way around. Langambula is going down. Uh, Perez is taking the fight on short notice, so he's also going to have uh, a little bit of an issue cutting weight too. So that might actually draw him out some. Uh, I'll start with Perez. His southpaw, obviously, he's he's aggressive on the feet, marches forward, uh, has a really wide stance, which helps him draw power. However, it also leaves him open to get his legs kicked out. He has the overhand left that he really uh, loves. He kind of looks for it a little too much. Uh, he does have hard kicks to the body. He finds his range, but he does a lot of hand fighting, which is always a good way to find your range. The negative is it also puts your opponent in range. So um, I, I've always been a – I like parrying punches. I don't like reaching. He does a lot of reaching. Uh, he he keeps uh, – he keeps his chin high in the air and kind of has a uh, little overconfidence in striking, which we saw against Duplessis when he got knocked out. Um, I did like that he was using some hip feints that I never saw him do before, uh, which is good considering he throws hard leg kicks. I'm sorry, hard body kicks. Uh, he also, when you attack him, he backs straight up on the center line. And Duplessis started off really slow, but it was starting to really pick him apart later on as that fight went deeper into the first round. Perez is a good grappler, um, but he's not a great wrestler to get the fight to the ground. But if he does, he has six submission wins, so that's good. Move over to, to Langabula. He, like you mentioned, he's already 35 years old. He's such a wild card. I love the Sokuju reference. I, I, I wonder how many people will remember uh, a, a guy that, in a very short amount of time, put the MMO world on fire by having back-to-back Huge, massive upset wins uh, against uh, Little Nagara and Ricardo Arona. Uh, obviously, back to Langabula, explosive, huge power, though he's not very technical on the feet. Uh, he does parry punches. He does the opposite of what Perez does. Uh, he backs straight up. He loads up on every single thing. Kind of wait. He, he, he has low volume, though, because he kind of waits for the perfect blow, like throwing um, everything he has into it. His clinch game... Though he doesn't use his judo, as you mentioned, his clinch game is very strong. Obviously, he's a judo black belt, national team member. Obviously, has big trips, big throws. He's very solid, solid takedown. It's hard to take down. If he does get taken down, he struggles to get back up. And I think that has to do with the judo background. Because in judo, you remember when, the, when the, you hit the canvas, you only have a couple seconds of grapple and then they stand you back up. So it's not really a big thing in judo to scramble back to your feet. Um, he also slowed down against Ankalaev, which makes the cut down to middleweight even more concerning. You are very, very confident in the, your pick, and I'm going to match you in the confidence. I like Lambu in this in the matchup a lot. Uh, Perez can be, as I mentioned, can be overconfident at times, and you can't do that against a guy like Lambu. If you walk into a shot, he is going to put you out. He has so much power. I think Perez is not going to be able to get this fight to the ground, and I think eventually. Um, Lingam really just touches his chin, as you mentioned, knocks him on the first round. I'm so confident. I'm locking in this as my lock of the night. Lingam Bula, my first round knockout. Next up, flyweights take the cage once again as Sue Mudarji takes on Zaruk Adashev. Mudarji, 24 years old from China. He is 13 and 4 in his mixed martial arts career. He is 2 and 1 in the UFC, having fought most recently. Uh, last November, and knocked out Malcolm Gordon in just 45 seconds. Adashev, the 28-year-old uh, Uzbekistani by way of Brooklyn, is just 3-2 and two in a very brief mixed martial arts career. Uh, he made his UFC debut in June of 2020, getting knocked out by Tyson Nam in just 32 seconds. 
Sue, one of the bigger favorites on the card is around minus 420, where Adashev is available around plus 340. Keith, who do you like in this one? Um, so I like the improvements I've seen from Majari in his last – from the Sukhmata fight to the Malcolm Gordon fight. I mean, he's only 24 years old, but the big improvement we saw from those two fights is that he added power, which is something you start getting at, at age. I mean, he flattened Mal- Malcolm Gordon with shots. Uh, that was like the one negative we talked about uh, Malcolm Gordon uh, about him going into the Malcolm Gordon fight. Uh, he's southpaw. He's light on his feet. Good movement. He's fast. He darts in and out of range very well. He has this like a karate style where he throws kicks to all areas. Works behind a busy jab. Uh, good timing on his straight left hand. Uh, kicks everywhere. He has this like hook kick that he does that similar to like what Steve Thompson will do. He's not much of a wrestler, but if he ends up on top, he has pretty good top control and good ground and pound to move over to. And I, I might butcher this guy's name. I apologize, but Adashev, if I, if I said that correctly, right. um, I haven't seen too much of him. And, but what I did see, I'm not that very impressed. He looks like a regional fighter to be not a UFC level fighter. He only has five professional fights in his career, so he does not have much experience at all. And then his UFC debut was an absolute disaster. Uh of his total time fighting, he only has 25 total minutes of fight time. And the guys he beat have a combined record of four and six. So he's really feasted on some low-level competition. Now, from the X and Rose, he's a southpaw. He kind of fights and bursts. He, he just wants to slide in the pocket where he can um, burst with some combination. He does hit solid. He, like, he has some good snap on his punches. Uh, as far as grappling, I haven't seen enough of his grappling to really comment. So it's kind of like a wild card for me in that sense, like a little bit of an unknown. Uh, from what I've seen, this seems like a showcase fight for Majari. So I think Majari lights him up on the feet and then puts him out in the first round. So give me Majari by first round knockout. I'm feeling much of, of what you're putting down here. Uh, Mudarji, and it's interesting that, uh, we were just talking about uh, Wu Yanan, you know, last week because they were both signed out of you know China as like twenty year olds. But then I kind of forgot about them because they each just fought like once a year since then. The difference is that uh, Wu Yanan is kind of flattened out in terms of her development, where Mudarji has improved. Now he he debuted in the UFC on really short notice. And took on Louis Smolka and just got absolutely trucked. And I think because that happened and then, you know, he's only fought once per year since then, I kind of got that frozen in my mind. I remember thinking it was a bad idea when he dropped uh, to flyweight. I was wrong about that. I remember thinking we'd already seen his ceiling in the UFC, and I think I was wrong about that as well. You're right in that he's added power. Um. Because even I, I like his striking a lot. Even in the Smolka fight, he did the right thing. Like he got just destroyed the first round. Second round, Smolka comes running at him. He tags him up with a nice combination, and it just didn't matter. He didn't have the power. Not at that time in his career. Not at bantamweight. And Smolka just ran right through uh, his strikes. You know, took him down, mashed him again, and tapped him out in short order. He's not that fighter anymore. I really like him at uh, at flyweight. I don't know if he's a future top 10 guy, but it doesn't make much to take to make the top 10 at flyweight. So, uh, th- th- you know, it- it's going to take this and maybe like one, one more good fight. And he's going to be on, on the cusp of the, of the top 10 in this division. And this is absolutely a showcase fight for him. Adashev might be a good fighter, but we haven't seen it yet. He fought three times in Bellator against just really very Bellator undercard level competition. he, came to the UFC and just got flattened. I think that's going to happen again. Give me Mudarji by second round knockout. Next up, we have what should be a Bantamweight barn burner as Ricky Simone welcomes Gaetano Perello to the UFC. Simone, the 28-year-old, is 16-3 and three in his mixed martial arts career. He is 4-2 and two in the UFC. He won... A split decision over Ray Borg in May of last year, turning around a two-fight losing streak at the hands of Rob Font and Uriah Faber. Perello, the 28-year-old Belgian, 
is 15, 5, and 1 in his professional career. He makes his debut in the UFC, having not fought uh, at all in 2020. But he was on a two-fight winning streak in Euro beatdown before then. This is as good a place as any for, for me to, to say this. As I said off the top, there are eight fighters on this card who didn't fight at all in 2020, including two fighters uh, or four fighters making their UFC debuts, not having fought at all in over a year. It is explainable in some cases. You know, if your name is Figueredo or Nurmagomedov, the UFC has a, a built-in incentive to sign you, or at least you have a built-in way to, to get your, you know, to get your mixtape on on Dana White's desk, or more accurately on, you know, Sean Shelby's desk. But this is a 14-fight card. Like, why? Why sign Gaetano Perello to fill a space on this card. Like, what is it that you saw about this guy that hasn't fought in a year and had had a yeah, pretty good run in third tier European promotions before then? Like, what got this guy into the UFC? Uh, Manon Fioro. I, I, I like Manon Fioro as a, a prospect. But if you knew you needed to get Victoria Leonardo a fight, and credit to uh, Sherdog Associate editor Jay Petri for putting this in my head, but why did they have to sign someone for Leonardo to face? Where was Diana Belbitsa? Where was Lilia Shakirova, Liana Jojua, Hannah Goldie? If you, if you think that Leonardo is the truth and you, you want to build her up as a prospect, or if you think she's just another contender series, you know, expendable fighter and you want to use her to feed one of your other fires, put her in against Ariane Lipsky or Antonina Shevchenko. Like, why Like why did this uh, card expand to 14 fights with, like, a bunch of new fighter signings that just don't make a lick of sense? I don't get it at all, and it doesn't bother me because I'm going to be watching the fights anyway, and I'll probably enjoy them, but you're blurring the line and the value of what it means to even call somebody a UFC-level fighter. Like, wh what does it even mean? Having said that, I haven't seen much to tell me that Gaetano Perello is a UFC level fighter. Uh, he's a hard hitter, and he's aggressive, and he's fighting somebody in Ricky Simone. That hey, Simone is aggressive to a fault and can be caught. You know, like look at his big showcase fight where he got dusted by Uriah Faber in like thirty seconds just because he was so wild and so out of out of position. Having said that, Simone is is so much better than this guy at everything. Uh, it, it's interesting that, that Simone like kind of hit uh, hit the wall against Faber because a lot of what he does reminds me of Faber at his youngest and wildest. Just getting by on pure aggression and pure athleticism. Uh, Simone's a fantastic athlete. Um, whether he's striking or he is wrestling and looking to initiate a, a scramble, he is aggressive to a fault, uh, which is why he's just he's one of the most enjoyable fighters in the UFC to watch. I, I, I expect that he's going to run through uh, Perello here. I'd, he'll probably, you know, engage in a wild kickboxing match for the first 60 to 90 seconds. He may even get tagged. Again, you know, he is defensively porous, not because he doesn't know better, but because he's so bent on getting his own strikes through. But if, if he catches something that he doesn't like the taste of, I, he, he's going to take him down and uh, probably take his back and choke him out. Give me Ricky Simone by first round submission. I'm sorry to dump all that on you. Just unburden myself, like open my heart to you. But that, that's how I'm <laughs> feeling about this 14 fight card in the middle of the week. Well... Wow. I would have thought it'd been really funny if you went in that rant and then picked him to win. <laughs> that would have been the best part. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, he, Ricky Simone is a tough test for anybody in the UFC debut. In in fairness, um, Brian Kelleher was supposed to fight Ricky Simone. It was like a late scratch, but I agree. There's like enough guys on the roster that you didn't have to like go to. Is, is this the Belgium guy? I think he's from Belgium. Yep. Yeah, that no one ever heard of. 
Uh, I'll start with the Belgium guy that would have heard of. He's a good kickboxer from what I've seen. Uh, he's a, He likes to counter-strike. He has some fast, accurate hands, some decent power, a uh, lot of leg kicks. He has a step-in knee that I, you know, I love that. Uh, that's probably his best chance of catching Simone is, is Simone shooting for a takedown and him timing a knee. Uh, Plum clinch is pretty good. Uh, it's a dangerous area, too, that he could do some damage on, on Simone. Uh, he will batter knees up the middle when he has that plum clinch, but his takedown defense is not good, and he really struggles to get up, and that's not what you want against a guy like Ricky Simone. Uh, <laughs> Ricky Simone, I like Simone, but that favorite loss still stings. Uh, you, you can't, I mean, that, he's never going to live that one down. I, it kind of feels like to me when Ryan Bader got beat by Tito Ortiz, like just like, no, that should never happen at this point in their career. Uh, so when you're obviously a classic wrestle boxer, I, I like his last fight, some of the things he was doing. He was using a lot more feints, and he was freezing Ray Borg with his feints, and then he was sliding in the pocket and unloading some good uh, pocket boxing. He has pretty fast hands, and he will tack with like a high combination. He'll uh, he'll end with, or, or not, I shouldn't say end, but he'll have body strikes in the middle of those combinations. He'll vary from going high and low. I like that. But he will take a lot of damage, as you mentioned, because he'll invite a brawl. Like, he won't keep that set. He'll, he'll, like, there was times he was beating up Ray Bog, and he was, like, encouraging Ray Bog to, like, sit down and just let's throw down and let's get 50K. Uh, so he, that, he obviously takes a lot of damage. He checks leg kicks, which very few fighters do, so I like that, too. He's a great wrestler. I mean, he was manhandling Ray Borg, another good wrestler, uh, you know, picking up slam him. Now, Ray Borg's a lot smaller than, than him, but still a good sign. Great entries, good cop control. As far as as a prediction, this is definitely um, uh, Simone's fight to lose. Perillo might have an advantage on the feet, and that's a big might, but he will not have the advantage on the ground. Simone has a massive advantage on the ground. I think Simone takes him down, too. I think he grinds on. Now, you said first-round submission, so I will go with a second-round submission. Time for some more middleweight action as Omari Akhmedov and Tom Brees lock it up at UFC on ESPN 20. Akhmedov, the 33-year-old Dagestani, is 25 and 1 in his professional career. He is 8-4 and 1 in the UFC. Most significantly, he is 3-1 and 1 since moving to middleweight a couple of years ago. He'll be taking on Brees, the 29-year-old Brit, who is 12 and 2 as a mixed martial artist, is 5 and 2 in the UFC and is 2-1 since moving to middleweight himself. Uh, Brees currently sitting as a slight favorite around minus 155, with Akhmedov available at plus 135 on the comeback. Keith, how do you feel about this one? Well, first thing is, I feel, I really like the matchup in a sense of, it's going to answer a lot of questions, specifically questions about Tom Brees. Uh, I'll start with Akhmedov. Akhmedov, he it's a great athlete, but he just makes up for it by just being like pure tough, Dagestani strong. Uh, he works behind a jab. Uh, he wings power shots. They're not the most technical. They're kind of a little slow because he kind of wings them. Um, they're not like tight as as we were talking about Puno Soriano when he kind of tightened up his punches. That's when he started landing. Uh, he, though I do love that he will throw like a hook to the body. He, he does know to work the body. He has some pretty decent pop in his strikes. He's strong in the pocket, solid, dirty boxing, like the Randy Couture style boxing, like pull, pull down the back of the head and, you know, throw the uppercuts and the little short hooks. Uh, solid offensive wrestler. I mean, he's taken down the likes of Chris Weidman and Ian Heinish, and both those guys are a lot more accomplished wrestlers than, than Tom Breeze is. He's also crazy strong. He picked up and slammed. Like he picked Ian Heinish up in the air and slammed him. Solid takedown defense. Though when he's taken down, he really struggles to get up. I mean, Chris Weidman uh, won their fight simply just by having top control on him. Cardio is also an issue. He has gone 15 minutes, but he slows down heavily because he's either wrestling or throwing winging wild punches. Move on to Tom Breeze. He's very different style fighter than... Akhmedov, he's very technically sound. He's a southpaw, quick, accurate hands, great jab. It's it's more of a stinging jab. I mean, he dropped his his last opponent, KB Bueller, with the jab. He also has leg kicks that I really like. He he was doing that against Bueller. He's done that in a lot of other fights. The problem is I simply can't trust his brain. Now, 
beating KB Bueller, who took a fight on short notice, doesn't really convince me that he has beaten his battle with the anxiety issues. Uh, everyone seemed to jump on the bandwagon, and he's even the favorite in this fight, but I'm really, really hesitant. Uh, that said, I want to be wrong. Like I'm rooting for him to bat. To, you know, I'm rooting for anybody who's battling a a mental uh, disease or is whatever, like mental issues. Like I want them to win. So I'm kind of hoping I'm wrong. But the last time he was really tested was against Brandon Allen, and he looked like in that fight that he quit to me. Like when it started getting tough, he wanted out. That won't be the case with Akmedov. Akmedov, if things are going bad for him, he'll still battle through. So. I expect Mekhna to cut off the cage on him, to get a few takedowns, to grind Breeze out until Breeze quits. So give me Akhmedov by second round TKO from ground to pound. And uh, I'm going to throw this as my upset special because I don't think Akhmedov should be an underdog. Uh, you, you, lay, you, you put down there uh, a lot of things that I agree with, but the one I, I want to single out is it, it's it's hard to – well, I'm not rooting in either way, but it's it's hard to just make a clinical prediction about someone like Brees, who has been open about mental health issues, about having just crippling anxiety. Uh, I mean, to me personally, people who are open about mental health issues and, and help to destigmatize them are, are heroic. It's a brave thing to do. But sitting here as an, an analyst, it's... Even even if I think mental issues are just like any other health issue, like you, you can get help for them, you should get help for them, you shouldn't be ashamed. It's hard for me to talk about it like it's a knee or an ankle, like, or you know, hey, you know, I I hope Akhmedov's cardio holds up and I hope Breeze's like brain holds up, you know, like that feels terrible to say, uh, but you know, so like I I don't mean this to be like insulting or demeaning at all, but I'm feeling uh, uh, the same thing you're putting out here. Akhmedov has a gas tank problem. He's fought five times at middleweight. He's gone to the judges' scorecards every single time and win, lose, or draw. And again, he's three, one, and one, so mostly win. But even having won three of his five fights, he has lost the third round four out of five times. And the only time he didn't lose it was against um, Zach Cummings. And even in that one, that was the closest of the three rounds. Like, if that had been a five-round fight, one, I would have turned off my TV. But two, you know, Cummings was, you know, he he was he was gaining momentum. So Akhmedov has a third-round problem. He has a gas tank problem. Uh, but he's a fast starter. Like you say, he's brutally strong. And he he does, I mean, he hasn't shown it at middleweight yet, but he has finishing ability in that first round. He's he's so aggressive. He he can just throw a man to the floor and, and punch his head into the canvas. So give me Akhmedov in this fight as well. But I, I'm going to say it does go to the scorecard, the scorecards, but just Akhmedov is, is too far ahead by then. Maybe even a 10-8 first round or something, or he's up two rounds to one. And even if Breeze puts on a valiant showing in the last round, it, it's not enough. Give me Akhmedov by decision. With that, we move over to the main card as Laurent Murphy takes on Douglas Silva de Andrade in a featherweight contest. Murphy, the 29-year-old Brit, is 9-0-1 in his professional career. He is 1-0-1 since joining the UFC in 2019. In his debut, he fought to a split draw with Zubaira Takugov. He came back from that to knock out Ricardo Hamos with punches in the first round of their fight in July of 2020. He welcomes uh, Silva de Andrade back to the UFC after a year off and ongoing uh, narrative as we go through this card. Uh, Douglas Silva de Andrade, the 35-year-old Brazilian, is 26-3 and three with one no contest. He is 4-3 and three in the UFC. And to give you an idea of how long he's been out, his last fight was a win over Hanan Barrow in November of 2019. Uh, Murphy, a strong favorite here, available at uh, minus 290. Douglas Silva de Andrade as the underdog is around plus 240 to plus 250. Keith, who do you like in this one? Well... Man, this is a weird matchup. Um, not one that I expected after Laurent Murphy beat uh, Ricardo Hamas. 
Uh, I'll start with the Andrade. We haven't seen him in a long time, which is honestly. And before okay. you even start, I, I should have made the point that he is moving up to featherweight after having spent his entire UFC career at Bantamweight <laughs> until now. But please go ahead. Yeah, so he uh, he's and he's short. He was always short for Bantamweight too, which is not a good sign. Uh, it's also I, I do like that he's moving up in the sense as he's getting older, but he's always been short, so I, it kind of it kind of balances it out. Uh, he's thirty five, which is something you can't really like for a guy um, in the lower weight classes. He he's a pocket boxer because you know his if his height he has to slide in the pocket he unloads lots of hooks he throws from his hips so he kind of loses some power which is extra bad considering power shots is what he's always looking for he loads up on almost every shot his left hook is his best punch um though he will throw these like spinning attacks out there though they're not very effective they're mostly just wasting energy he doesn't check leg kicks. That's uh, I mean, Henan Barrow was having success with leg kicks. He has some decent entries, though. Um, he's he's not as good as a grappler as a commentary team will make him sound. He's more of a top side grappler. When he's on top, he's pretty good. But when he's on bottom, he's pretty weak defensively. Um, struggles off his back. I mean, a wash of Henan Barrow was taking him down, and it was made it a pretty close fight. He also only has one submission win in his in, on his record, uh, though. I will give him credit. He has pretty good cardio for someone who throws so hard. Move over to Laurel Murphy. Uh, so Laurel Murphy has got a weird record in the UFC with a draw and a win. I don't think he beat Tuka Goff. I thought Tuka Goff clearly won that fight. It was a really weird draw. Uh, to the technical sense of him, he's a guy who can fight from both stances. He's pretty elusive. He's got good head movement. uses feints wells. Uh, he, adds, he, he does a little fainting with the shoulder rolls, which, which I like to see. That's something that you see a lot of it with boxers. He fights behind a jab. He'll even double up the jab, which we don't see. Not another thing that a lot of boxers do. Uh, he is accurate. Throws hard hooks to the body, though he can sometimes overthrow and leave himself out of position, uh, and also open to a counter. He throws hard kicks to the body. Uh, he throws a lot of leg kicks. He will occasionally look for a takedown himself. He almost caught Tuku off in the guillotine, which was very impressive. Though I wouldn't consider him a like heavy grappler because then he doesn't have a single submission in his career. If he's on top, he has some really good ground and pound. We saw that when he knocked out Ricardo Ramos in his last fight. Uh, though he is a weak defensive wrestler, he couldn't get off the bottom like with Tukov on top of him. I mean, the commentators talked about Tukov slowing down in that fight. But one thing they mentioned is like how much Murphy slowed down in that fight. Now, I know I mentioned that Tukov you know, kept him down. It seems like that's like an ongoing theme with the fighter in this card. I keep talking about how many people are defensive Floyd, I think it's just just by chance on this card. Murphy shouldn't be a three to one favorite. Like this betting line should be much closer. I really want to pick DeAndrage. However, I simply just can't trust his age. So you know, at this age and being gone for so long, so I'm gonna take Murphy. But I'm gonna say it's a much closer battle than most people expect. So I'm gonna take Murphy. And I'm gonna take him by unanimous decision. Outstanding. Uh- yeah, I I I agree with you about the Tukugov fight. And incidentally, you and I both scored that fight for Tukugov at the time. The the weirdness of that one was over the question of whether Tukugov had gotten a 10-8 first round. But even so, it should have been at least a majority decision for him. The weird thing was that like one fighter gave Murphy the the second and third rounds or something like that. It it, it was dumb. But nonetheless, he looked really good in taking a huge step up in competition, you know, taking his UFC debut against Tukugov. That I really think they were just trying to get Tukugov a winnable fight because that was him coming back from like two and a half years away for his uh, for injury and then for uh, his role in the whole brawl at the McGregor-Khabib uh, fight. Uh, but uh, that's that's a, a irrelevant history lesson. Uh Douglas Silva de Andrade, I, I remember being kind of hyped for this guy when he made his uh, UFC debut, which ironically was on Tukugov against Tukugov as well. I believe it was on short notice because that was his only fight at, at featherweight in the UFC. But I mean, he he was on like a 20 fight winning streak, 18 of them by knockout. And then he just promptly became just another guy. You know, like he was clearly outclassed against guys like Peter Yan and Rob Font. Uh, he won a fight over a, a not yet really developed Marlon Vera. 
I I just don't think he's he's just another guy at bantamweight. I don't even know if he's that at featherweight. Whereas I I like Murphy's progress as a prospect. Uh, I like Murphy in this one as as well. I think I, I like him a little more strongly than you do. Maybe I just really, really don't believe in in DeAndrage. But uh, give me Murphy and give me Murphy by uh, by second round knockout. I think he's gonna touch him up in in the first round. Maybe things go to the ground in the second, and and he ends up on top and and just punches him out. Uh, you know, with ground and pound again. It's another flyweight contest as Tyson Nam and Matt Schnell go at it on the main card of UFC on ESPN 20. Nam, the 37-year-old, is 20, 11, and 1 as a professional mixed martial artist. He is 2-2 two and two in the UFC, uh, having lost his first two fights in the octagon to Sergio Pettis and Kai Kara France, then turned it around with wins over Zaruk Adashev and Jerome Rivera last year. He'll be taking on Schnell, the 31-year-old from Louisiana, is 14 and 5. He's 4 and 3 in the UFC. He is yet another fighter on this card who is coming back after being off for all of 2020, but he did fight in December of 2019 where he lost a first round uh lost by first round knockout to Alessandro Pantoja, snapping what had been a four-fight winning streak for him. Uh, Nam is a very slight favorite here, sitting around minus 130, where you can get Schnell around plus 110. Uh, for I, I, It feels like for 10 years, it wasn't 10 years, it was more like five or six, but it feels like for 10 years, I was like, man, I'd really love to see Tyson Nam get to the UFC at some point. I always thought he was one of the kind of one of the better kind of, you know, bantamweight size fighters outside the UFC with a really exciting style. He's, you know, he, he's definitely a, a knockout artist or, you know, always a guy who's looking for the knockout. Uh, and by the time he actually made it to the UFC, he was like, you know, 35 years old. I'm glad he's here. It's uh, been a pretty good uh, story for him. He got matched tough in his first two fights, like Sergio Pettis, especially if you're a low volume brawler knockout artist like Nam is. Sergio Pettis is a tough ask. And then, you know, he uh, ran into Kai Car France in uh, his second fight. Nam is w- what he is. He, you know, he, he, he wants the knockout. He makes for exciting fights. He wants to knock out in spite of, he, he's not a super high volume striker. You know, he, he's kind of a wait for that one big shot guy, which always worked fine outside the UFC. It's, you know, it's, once you get to the UFC level and guys are more defensively sound, guys have better chins, they're just better athletes, that it, it sometimes, you know, doesn't work out quite as well. It's worked out okay. You know, he's he's been a solid roster guy. He's fighting a guy in Schnell that Schnell's weaknesses kind of line up with Nam's strength. You know, it... it if, if there's a guy in the, the division that Nam can wait, 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 and try to just nail with a, a knee or a huge punch, Schnell might be one of the better guys that that will reliably work on. This is one of the few fights on the card where I feel as though the line maybe even should be a little wider. Uh, give me Nam to do Nam things, and even at age 37, uh, put another octagon win on his resume via first-round knockout. This is my lock of the night. Why not? All right. So that was like your very confident pick. You locked it in as your lock. I'm nowhere near as confident as you are. Like this is one of the fights I've been flip-flopping on. I'll start with your boy, Nam. Uh, he's got obviously tons of experience. He's got 32 fights. He's, you mentioned his age. Uh, or Sorry, you mentioned that you, you've been wanting him to be in the UFC for a long time. Well, that's because he's 37 years old. He's, he's this weird guy that... He looks better at 37 than he did at 27. Um, that said, being that he's 37, that's very still troublesome to me, being that he's an, you know, at that age, especially in the lower division, where he could just have a drop-off. If you have like a little decline in speed at all, you, you're falling way down in the flyweight rankings. Um, that said, he got he does a lot of great things. I mean, he stays very defensively tight. 
Uh, he got some really good timing on his counter shots. Nice snap on his shots. He got some big power, as you kept mentioning. He's got 12 knockouts in his in his career. He targets the body, uh, but he also chases the knockout, which I don't like. And he and you mentioned you you know you mentioned he he looks for the one punch shot. He he can be too patient with that, almost to a fall where he's being so trigger shy that he gives away big moments in the fight because he just has a low output. And if he doesn't knock him out, you kind of giving away rounds. Uh, that was something he did against Sergio uh, Pettis was he was just scared to pull the trigger. He he's a decent wrestler. He can sneak in a, a like a body lock takedown, though he almost neglects his wrestling. So I, I'd be very surprised to see him wrestle here. But when he is on top, we saw in his last fight against Jerome Rivera, he's got some really good ground and pound to put you out. Though he's probably not going to submit. You. He only has one submission in his career. Moving to Snell, uh, Snell's more ra- well rounded. He's on the feet. He's got some good footwork. He's an aggressive striker. He uses feints from a distance really well to to give himself some openings, but he's also can slide in the pocket on loan to barrage, but that's where he gets himself in trouble because he, in, he invites a brawl in the pocket. He is a good pocket boxer and he has some pretty good power. Uh, he rocked Alexander Panchoja in his last fight. However, his chin might be a problem because he also got rocked by Pantoja and then eventually knocked out by Pantoja in the same fight. And Pantoja doesn't have the power that Tyson Nim has. Uh, as far as the grappling, I see he was well rounded. He's a good grappler. He has uh, eight submission wins. Uh, he finds like head attacks, guillotines, darts, chokes, and, and scrambles. But he also can get submissions off his back. He's got triangle chokes, arm bars off his back. Uh, he might be a little overconfident in his grappling, though. Like his last fight, he tried to pull guard. Oh, actually, I didn't try. He did pull guard against Pantoja, which is really kind of crazy considering Pantoja is such a good grappler. Uh, though he did realize his make. His, his mistake immediately and, and work back to his feet. So as far as prediction, I flip flopped. I'm like, I don't really know who's going to win. Like I'm, I, I see avenues for victory. Snell's going to have to avoid the bombs from Nam. If he invites a brawl, he's probably getting knocked out, knocked out. That said, as my buddy, Marcel Dolph used to always say, Snell's more rounded, more well rounded. He has more avenues to victory. So I'm going to go with Snell by split decision. So I guess, uh, I guess we're going two opposite ways on this one, my man. Well, this, yeah, this is as wide a dissension as we've had so far on the card. So uh, one of us will have the big grin uh, come recap time, and the other one of us will be glad that we're just doing a real short recap of this card. (laughs) We stay in the flyweight division, but move over to the opposite side of the the aisle as the veteran Roxanne Mataferi takes on Viviane Araujo. Mata Ferry, the 38-year-old, is 25 and 17 in what can only be described as a pioneering uh, career for uh, for a female mixed martial artist in particular. She is four and five in the UFC, but one of those losses was off of her first appearance in The Ultimate Fighter way back in 2013. Since returning to the UFC, she is an even four and four, having perfectly alternated wins and losses. She'll be taking on Araujo. The 34-year-old Brazilian is 9-2 and two in her professional career. She is 4-1 and one in the UFC, uh, having fought most recently last September and won a unanimous decision over Montana De La Rosa. Araujo is a strong favorite, coming in around minus 340 to minus 350. Mata Ferry is available around plus 280, plus 285. Keith, is there any cash value in the stiff underdog, Mataferi? Well, one thing we've learned in the past, too, when Mataferi is a big underdog, she can find a way to get people paid. So, yeah, I think there is some value there. Uh, I'll start with her. As you mentioned, she's one of the most experienced fighters in all of women's MMA. Uh, she's been doing this forever. She's not a good athlete, though. I, I don't think she would call herself a good athlete. I think that's not a surprising statement. Uh, she's a high output striker, but she has a very awkward style to strike. And she kind of just blitzes forwards, throwing punches, not a lot of power in her shots. She has some big holes defensively. She's she's slow. She doesn't have a lot of head movement. Uh, she if she can get the fight, if she can close the distance and get the fight in the clinch, she does pretty well there. She can grind in the clinch. She's you know she's a bigger woman. She's tall. Uh, her 
plump clinch is good due to her height. She will sneak in a takedown if she gets it to the ground. Solid ground and pound. She is a submission threat from, from top and bottom, uh, though I don't think she's as big of a submission threat as the commentary team makes her sound like. They make it sound like like the female Ryan Hall. Uh, she's a weak defensive wrestler, though she makes up for a lot of uh, her flaws by just having ins- insane hot and just, just fortitude to continue to fight on. Uh, she'll never stop. Move to Orojo. Orojo is everything that Matafari isn't. She's fast. She's athletic. She's elusive. She's got good head movement. She's well-rounded. She can fight from both stances. She got some really good timing on her counter strikes. She does very well to, uh, especially in her last fight, she feints to draw out attacks. She will attack the body. Very good leg kicks. Though she doesn't check leg kicks. That's uh, a big glare weakness that's actually where jessica i had the most success was just kicking out the inside of her leg she's well-rounded she can good entries can uh, either she'll get a takedown from shooting on the hips or just catching a leg and taking down heavy top pressure uh she did fade late in her fight against jessica i though i think that has less to do with cardio and more to do with arusha being a little bit of a front runner where this was like the first time she was truly tested in i it was a big step up in competition and when i would just wouldn't back down from her. I think she shut down a little bit, though she looked much better against another good competition than Montella De Rose De La Rosa in her last fight. As a prediction, Montefiore is crafty. She has tons of heart. She has a history of upsetting people. How Arosha doesn't have all those intangibles, but she has so many more weapons. I think she utterly dominates Montefiore over 15 minutes. I think we're going to have a 10-8 round. We might even have some multiple 10-8 rounds. Give me a, give me a Rojo and an absolute landslide decision victory. There you have it. Uh, I've been a, I've been a fan of this sport for a, a pretty good while. And, you know, always kind of gravitated, you know, towards the women's fights. Uh, especially because in, you know, 2004, they were more of a rarity. where There was a novelty to it. Whoa, you know, women do this too. And, hey... Some of these women are, are are quite good at it. That was a, that was a great fight. In 2004, Roxanne Mataferi beat Jennifer Howe when Jen Howe was the number one woman in the weight class and probably the number one pound for pound woman in the sport. Uh, in 2007, she beat Marlouz Kunin when Marlouz Kunin was the number one fighter in the weight class and at least one of the top three pound for pound women in the sport. In 2010. She beat Tara La Rosa when Tara La Rosa was the number one woman in the division and close at least to being the number one pound for pound woman in, in the sport. Having said all that, I think Mata Ferry is actually as more dangerous in 2021 than she has been at any point in her career. Because the thing about all those other fights is she should have been a flyweight the whole time. Like, there's no way she should have been fighting like these women who had to cut to make it to, to 135 uh, pounds. Uh, she, she's in her right weight class, finally. You're right in that she's not a plus athlete. In fact, she's one of the more minus athletes in the sense of just how would they do it at decathlon in the history of high-level mixed martial arts. But the, the thing about it is she's actually has more power as a striker than she did earlier in her career. Partly, I think, because she's fighting at 125 now and partly because, you know, she's physically a little bit stronger and has better mechanics. The The biggest risk for Mata Ferry out of Arojo is that she gets blitzed and just starts getting really, really tagged up on the feet by the much faster, quicker, more explosive woman. There's certainly the risk of that. Uh, you know, Mata Ferry, since she's been back in the UFC this time, all but one of her fights have gone to decision and they've been mostly defined by is Mata Ferry the better wrestler of them? Is she the one that, that can make the fight happens where she want, wants it to happen? I think that's what this one's going to, going to hinge on, you know, is, is she going to be able to keep Arujo at bay on, on the feet? Is she going to be able to get it to the ground if she's hurt, if, and when she's hurt? Cause I, like you, I expect she's going to take some damage in this fight. Uh, she's not been stopped since coming back to the UFC and really not even close to stopped. Mostly she's just lost because she kind of ran out of time and was stuck. Uh, this is a fight where she could get hurt 
a fight where well, potentially she could even get finished, even though she's not been finished in a long, long time. As much as I hate to to bank on intangibles, the intangibles here run both ways. Obviously, Mata Ferry is crafty. She's tough. Tons of heart. You know, she some some really kind of just disheartening, deflating losses to Murphy and Maya and Eubanks. And in, in all of them, she was still trying to finish the fight, you know, knowing she was probably behind two rounds to none at the end of the fight. And that's against Araujo, who, as you say, it, I think has come off as a bit of a front runner. I think Mata Ferry in this fight, she's going to take Araujo's best shot in the first round. You're right. We might have a 10-8 first round. Uh, but she's going to she's gonna take her best shot. And when she's still coming at her in the second round and then in the third, I think Mata Ferry's going to pull ahead. I know she's a huge underdog in this fight. There's a good reason she's an underdog in this fight. Uh, just like... I told you earlier, I, I can't get the image of Sue Mudarji just getting trucked in his debut out of my mind. I can't get the image out of my mind of Araujo debuting in the UFC two weight classes up and just blowing away Toledo Bernardo. And if she does that to Mata Ferry, I, I should have known better than to make this my upset pick of the evening. But this is my upset pick of the evening. Give me Roxanne Mata Ferry by decision. All right. That brings us to the heaviest bout of the evening, a light heavyweight clash between Ike Villanueva and Vinicius Moreira. Villanueva, the 36-year-old Texan, is 17 and 11, 0 and 2 in the UFC since uh, stepping up on short notice back in May of 2020. He lost to Chase Sherman in that uh, debut, then got a uh, second go in the octagon in August where he lost via an early doctor stoppage to Jordan Wright. Not that it was early, like unfairly early, but just that it was early in the fight. Anyway, uh, Vinicius Moreira, 31 year old Brazilian is nine and four. He is 0 and three in the UFC after having joined from the original season of Dana White's contender series, Brazil. Uh, since then, he fought three times in 2019, losing to Alonzo Menafield, Eric Anders, and Paul Craig, and then took off all of 2020, as so many other fighters on this card did. Villanueva, a slight favorite, uh, minus 140. Moreira sitting there around plus 120. This, I, I mean, th this fight is a perfect indication of what this card is like. From what I see on the bout sheet, this is the third fight from the top, and it features somebody who is on a two-fight losing streak against a guy who is on a three-fight losing streak and hasn't fought in a year. Well, actually closer to a year and a half in his case. I think the Craig fight was like in September of 2019. At any rate, uh, obviously my, my personal bias comes in here because not only is Ike Villanueva a... Houstonian, but he is a Houstonian that I personally like. You know, there are plenty of fighters that, hey, you know, Houston, go represent. Ike Villanueva is a super, super good guy. I drove from Houston to Corpus Christi just to see him uh, knock out former UFC fighter Roger Narvaez uh, in what feels like five years ago, but is like a year ago. At any rate, Villanueva great guy you're not. He is what he is as a fighter, both at light heavyweight and at heavyweight. Uh, he's a slow paced power boxer. Uh, you know, he does have, he has pretty fast hands for a guy wh whose feet are not fast. Uh, pretty fast, fast hands, uh, you know, decent, uh, like a decent defense as, as a boxer. He is capable of wrestling, although you're not going to see any wrestling in, in this fight or, if you do, it's it's not a good sign. Uh, good good pop on his punches, but at least through what he's shown so far, that's that's really all he does at a UFC level. And even that is just you know at at a moderate UFC level. He's taking on Moreira, who's much more of an unknown. Because for one thing, yeah, he lost his first three fights in the octagon, but that was a brutal lineup to take on. I mean, Alonzo Menafield, back when he was knocking out everything, 
Eric Anders back when he was knocking out everything, and then Paul Craig. And if you are a submission specialist, Paul Craig is kind of, is kind of the worst possible matchup for you because he's a very tough guy with decent cardio and is titanic for the for the division. Uh, even though th- there's not a whole lot of momentum between these two guys, it's a pretty obvious two outcome fight to me. Either Villanueva knocks him out in the first round or Moreira taps him out in the first round or it goes to the second round and Moreira probably taps him out in the second round. Uh, I'm going with the first outcome. I think uh, Villanueva, he, he's getting his, his third chance here. His uh, his slight favorite status on the books is more of an indication of Moreira being an unknown quantity. But uh, Villanueva lives to fight another day in the octagon. He's going to knock out Moreira in the first round, and he's gonna he's gonna get another fight. Yeah. So this is obviously two guys who are fighting for their job. You mentioned it. The first round submission or first round knockout is likely. That's probably why this is on the main card. Is that UFC is hoping for one of those outcomes? Uh, I'll start with uh, Villanueva. I'm glad that you. He's a nice guy. He doesn't look like a UFC level fighter to me. He's 36. Uh, he is a striker, not very athletic. He kind of attacks and spurts, throws combos. I agree with you that he his hand speed is pretty good, but like you mentioned, his feet aren't his 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 ability to get into range isn't. Uh, DC pointed out in the Chase Sherman fight that his best punch is probably his left hook. If he knocks out uh, Marrera, it'd probably be that left hook. He does have power to his credit. He has 14 career knockouts. He has some huge defensive holes though. He lacks head movement. He backs straight up. He had no answer to the leg kicks by Chase Sherman. Uh, His chin might be coming an issue, too. Uh, He was knocked out a few times on the regional scene, and then he was knocked out by Chase Sherman. He was, you know, he wasn't knocked out, but he was rocked by Jordan Wright right in the beginning of that fight. Uh, I don't really see a lot of wrestling on him and grappling. I'll take your word for it. I I haven't seen that much. He does not have a submission in his entire career, which is obviously troublesome. Movo Tamarero, he's also not very athletic. His striking is ugly, or I shouldn't say it's ugly. It's it's basically non-existent. Um, I'm I'm. If I'm worried about Villanueva's chin, I'm extra worried about Marrera's chin. I mean, as you mentioned, he was knocked out by Menafield, knocked out by Eric Anders. He was submitted by Paul Craig, but he was also it was a club and sub submission. He was dropped, and then Craig jumped on a submission. He is a good grappler, and he's relentless in his pursuit of the takedowns. Uh, he will pull guard if he can't get you down, which you know I doing the show with me enough. You know I hate that. He does have eight submission wins on his career, both on the top and body. She has ability to finish the fight. I have zero confidence in this pick. Uh, it's your classic striker versus grappler. I think both guys aren't good. Usually the grappler wins. So I will go that route and I'll take Marrera by you said first round submission. So I'll, I will go first round submission. With that, we come to the co-main event of the evening as Warley Alves Returns to the UFC after uh, being off for all of 2020 and takes on Munir Lazes. Alves, the 30 year old Brazilian, is 13 and 4 in his mixed martial arts career. He is 7 and 4 in the UFC since uh, joining back in 2014. He fought most recently in November of 2019, where he got triangled by Randy Brown. Before that, he knocked out Sergio Marias with a ridiculous uh, Street Fighter Mortal Kombat uppercut in May of 2019. Lazes, the 33-year-old Tunisian, joined the UFC in July of 2020, uh, taking a unanimous decision as an underdog against Abdul Razak Al Hassan. Lazes. Uh, despite the disparity in UFC experience, is a comfortable favorite, sitting around minus 225, where you can get Warley Alves at plus 185. Keith, how do you feel about this one? 
Um, I think I'm really surprised of all the fights on the card that this is the co-main event. Um, Wally, I think <laughs> Wally's last fight was a prelim, and now he's on the co-main event. Uh, you mentioned Wally Alves is 30 years old. I didn't look that up to make sure that was right. He just seems like he should be older. I mean, he was on the Contender Series. I mean, I mean um, the Ultimate Fighter Series. Uh, I just looked it up seven years ago, so that's probably why I thought he was be older than he is. Uh, he's kind of the opposite of Villanueva. Like, he has good movement. He's pretty elusive, but his hands are kind of slow. So he's like, his feet are pretty fast, but his hands are kind of slow. Uh, and that mostly is because he's a grappler that suddenly wants to be a striker. He does hit hard. Uh, he will attack the body. He was doing that with Sergio Moraes. And he was kicking out the legs of Sergio Moraes, which I liked a lot. Um, but that's it. Like, he's... he really should be grappling more than than he does. When he does grapple, he's good in the clinch. He can really grind it out. Uh, if he can get the fight to the ground, he's a Brazilian just a black belt, has some slick back takes, had James Krause's back, which is a good accomplishment. Uh, obviously, he could have submitted uh, Colby Covington way back in the day. Uh, he has hard grinding pound if he hits up on top. Uh, he showed signs of wearing down, though. That's really troublesome to me. I, I go back to the James Krause fight. He was gassing out, and it was only the second round when he was gassing, when he showed big signs of, of being fatigued. Uh, also, though he's a legit grappler, he got submitted by Randy Brown in his last fight, which seems to me like the bottom is really falling off on Wally Alves. Now, move out to Lizaz, or Laziz. I don't know if I'm saying his, his name correctly, but uh, this guy's... Like the opposite. He's fast. He's athletic. He's so fluid in his striking. Has some high output. Has some really good diversity in his striking. He works behind a really long jab. Um, he actually will double it up. He unloads. Pow- when he unloads, he unloads power shots in combinations, which I love. He'll target the body. He loves push kicks. He has this, like, he can just snap up a high kick and, like, instantly. He kept throwing a step in knee that was getting ball filled and excited. I was getting even more excited. He's not a one punch knockout guy, but he's a plus power guy. Like he could, he will hurt you with his punches. His clinch game is on point too. He was destroying Razak Al Hassan with knees and elbows inside the clinch. What Al Hassan did have success of him, it was when he was pressure because he he doesn't really like pressure. He likes to just cover up. When he's working from distance, he he wants to keep distance. And when he wants it in close, he wants to be the one to be crushed in the pocket. He doesn't really want it to be coming at him. He doesn't really like to fight off his back foot. That's the one big floor I saw in him. Uh, that said, he has a great chin. I mean, he ate some big shots from Al Hassan and like didn't even budge. Uh, though I do think that Al Hassan might have gassed himself out a little bit in that fight. So um, but if you can eat those big shots from him, that'll help him gas out. Uh, he was adding in takedowns. He's uh, when he's been taken down in the past, he gets gets up to his feet, and he's got a good submission defense. Obviously, all the things I said, I like Lazez a lot. I think he styles on the feet, uh, uh, styles on Al's on the feet with volume and variety. I think he overwhelms him, and I think he takes him out in the second round. So give me Lazez by second round knockout. Great. If you told me, like, if you say if you were like in Morley Alvis's training camp and you told me, no, he is going to try to get this fight to the ground as early and as often as possible, I would feel as though this fight was closer. But uh, Alvis has, he, he's too willing to stay out there on the gunnery range, and it's not going to be a good decision against Munir Lazes. Alvis. I mean, he's probably still a plus athlete, but he was a plus plus athlete five years ago. And a, a little has come off of that. I agree with you that, uh, you know, his, his gas tank isn't like, it, it isn't quite, you know, what it was. Part of the reason he lost to Randy Brown is that he initiated the takedown and just brought him down in bad position. Like, I mean, Brown already probably has the longest legs in the welterweight division, but he basically just like slammed himself in practically into a triangle. Uh, but I, I don't think, I don't think it's even gonna gonna come up. I don't think he's gonna be able to get it to the ground. Uh, if he's gonna try to bring Lazes down with, you know, a trip or throw from the clinch, good luck, Lazes is. Uh, weapons in in the clinch are fantastic 
when when Munir Lazes hits his ceiling in the UFC, whatever it is, I think it will be on the ground. His one loss is to Eldar Eldorov, who, for my money, he might be the best welterweight in the world outside of like the UFC, Bellator, and and Ryzen. Like he might be. He should be in the UFC already. I, I'll bet that he will be in the UFC in, in 2021. Like it's just a matter of time. But he is like the prototypical like Russian overwhelming wrestler. Uh, Alves does not have that route to victory. I'm with you. Uh, I think Alves, he'll probably mess around on the feet and get pieced up. By the time he starts really wanting it to go to the ground, I think he'll continue to get pieced up. Uh, just to be a little different from you, give me third round knockout. But uh, Munir Laza is big and he survives and advances and becomes one of the kind of one of the prized new properties of the promotion as this year goes on. 13 fights later, we arrive at our main event. A welterweight showdown between Michael Chiesa and Neil Magny. Chiesa, the 33-year-old, is 17-4 and in his mixed martial arts career. He was the winner and the most accomplished fighter to come from the 15th season of The Ultimate Fighter. He is 10-4 and since joining the UFC in the wake of that show. Most significantly, he is 3-0 and since moving up to welterweight after a pair of losses to Anthony Pettis and Kevin Lee at lightweight. Since then, he has defeated Carlos Condit, Diego Sanchez, and most recently, Rafael dos Anjos. Having said that, he is close to being yet another of the fighters not to have fought in 2020, as his last appearance was in January uh, of last year. So it's been almost a full year since he's fought as well. He takes on Magny, also 33 years old. Magny is 24 and 7 in his professional career. He was not the winner of the 16th season of The Ultimate Fighter, but is certainly the most accomplished fighter to come from that season. He is 17 and 6 in the UFC. Odds are close on this one. Magny just a slight favorite around minus 140, with Chiesa sitting there at plus 120 as the underdog. As I said, this is a fantastic fight on a competitive level. Just it's two guys that, you know, they have had kind of interesting, different, divergent paths to get where they are professionally. But in a competitive sense, it, it makes all, all the sense in the world. I've said for a long time that 155 might be the best division in the sport. But 170 is the hardest division to break into the top 10 in the UFC. You just have to string together so many wins in a row before you can even get a name that puts you into that discussion. These guys, I, I mean, that makes the stakes of this fight really high. Because the guy who wins this is a top 10 welterweight in uh, the UFC. The guy who loses, I mean, he might not get a chance to even get back there within the next year. He's going to win, uh, need to win a number of fights and probably win fights over less established guys trying to make their name off him. It's just a ruthless ladder in in the 10 through 25 of the welterweight division. Having said that stylistically, this, this fight has a little chance to be a dud. Uh, Chiesa is a, he's a willing and aggressive striker. Uh, he, he has a number of, uh, I mean, he has a, a number of weapons, but he's always been defensively porous again, especially against people who can go to the body, you know, body shots, a, a known weakness, but Magny is the, he may not be the kind of guy who can take advantage of that. Uh, you know, Magny is a, a high output kickboxer, medium uh, to low power. You know, we, we may just get uh, some active, but, you know, not sensational blazing kickboxing out of this. I would love to see what happens when this goes, uh, when and if this goes to the ground. Uh, Magny, despite being just a very tall, thin, rangy, Walter Waite, good offensive wrestler. Uh, where, you know, Chiesa, uh, not a great defensive wrestler, but he reacts better to being taken down than just about any fighter in the UFC. Uh, aggressive guard, but not really willing to just sit there and play guard. He's good at sweeping. Uh, and if he sweeps or can just get out far enough to force a, a scramble, outstanding at taking the back. Uh, one of the best back take, 
you know, specialists in, in the sport right now and a fantastic finisher once, once he gets there. Uh, Kies, I mean, a couple of Kies's last wins, he has done things to people with one arm in grappling that you should, you should need to, <laughs> to do it. Uh, you know, the way he had, uh, you know, Carlos Condit in almost like a police style hammer lock, you know, with one arm just completely twisted behind his back. And then something similar against Diego Sanchez. I forget the exact position. I'd love to see it if this fight gets to the ground. That like I think that's where this has the most potential to be an entertaining fight. As far as uh who wins, I know Magni is uh the slight favorite, but I think Magni's strengths actually they don't line up very well with with Kiesa's known deficiencies. I uh, give me give me Kiesa in this fight. Uh, give me Kiesa by by decision. Yeah, it's going to go all five rounds. It'll it'll probably be fun, but nobody will be screaming fight of the year. Uh, Kiesa by decision. Take us home, Keith. Man, so you said in the start of the broadcast that this was a fight that you're really excited about, and I'm I'm absolutely with you. It's one of those ones, especially when I started doing film study, it made me more excited because it is such a fascinating matchup. Uh, I'll start with Kiesa. I was never high on Michael Chiesa, but I had to completely reevaluate my opinion of him after the his last fight against RDA because that was such a brilliant performance. Uh, he is a one-dimensional fighter, but to be this successful in his career in, like you mentioned, like one of the most stacked divisions in all of MMA is absolutely incredible. It just shows like how good he is in that one area. He is also a massive welterweight which is so crazy when you think about that he used to fight at lightweight. He, I mean, he dwarfs the guys. Now, he's, in fairness, you know, his matchups have been against Diego Sanchez and RDA, two guys who fought at lightweight themselves, you know. Um, but, I mean, he was big against Carlos Condit. I mean, he's just a big dude. Uh, he's a southpaw, and you mentioned he's very aggressive on his feet, but he uses his striking to, in my opinion, to simply just try to back his opponent up to the fence because where he's going to shoot. Because he has a very awkward style where you don't expect him to just kind of like never take a step back. He's just going to keep coming forward. Uh, he he is open to leg kicks. RDA had a lot of success kicking out his legs. Um, he also just kind of wings punches without much technique. But when he does get in that shooting range, he will shoot immediately. He has good entries as far as speed goes, um, and he really does well to use his long arms to kind of close the distance. However, his entries aren't technically sound. What I mean by that, for, like in a wrestling sense, he bends over at the waist and kind of just shoots. And one of these days, he's going to eat a perfectly timed knee up the middle when he shoots. Uh, he's pretty good in the clinch, and that's just from his size and his just his um, his like mental state. Like he's a guy that wants, or just his outlook on fighting. He wants a grueling affair. He knows he does well in the grueling affair. Uh, he also has some good trips and good hip control where he, you know, he'll throw a wizard or something like that to get to the ground. He's good at winning scrambles. And that's based on his style of wrestling. He has a very funk style wrestling to him. Kind of like a, like a Tim Elliott has, or even like a Ben Asker. And he's more about hip control uh, high head, you know, being a high head in the scrambles, like that's kind of Kiesa's game. Uh, he obviously is a submission threat. I mean, he's got 11 submission wins in his career. However, I don't think he's the wizard on the ground that the commentators make it sound like. I mean, he was submitted by Anthony Pettis. He was also, like, he wasn't submitted by Kevin Lee, but he was likely to be about to be submitted by Kevin Lee. Um, but like you mentioned, his back takes are fantastic. He's got great control when he's on top and that's his strength he's more of a grind you out and then find a submission though recently he's just been finding him so easily uh move over to magni i want to just look at magni from the he had a break and then he came back with three fights i'm kind of just analyzing what he's done over those three fights he looked absolutely fantastic after that lang layoff he was phenomenal against Li jing leong he was phenomenal against robbie lala um, I thought he looked good against Anthony Rocco Martin. I actually scored it for Rocco Martin, but that was a very close fight that really could have went either way. Uh, you mentioned he's a high output striker. He's a fighter like Max Holloway, who we were breaking down last week, in the fact that he builds and gets strong as the fight goes on based on his insane uh, level of cardio. He pressures his opponent with his volume, and he's really learned recently 
how to use his length and keep his opponents at the end of his punches while still pressuring. He doesn't have a lot of tails, as you said. He just kind of throws, just kind of touches, doesn't really uh, unload on a lot of things. He's, he stays, he conserves a lot of energy. Even though he has a high output, he conserves a lot of energy because he stays so calm. He doesn't tense up, uh, which which is very good. He doesn't have one punch power at all. As you said, he has like low power. Uh, he works behind a jab. He loves to crash the pocket with a step in knee. Uh, he was having a lot of success against Rocco Martin with the calf kicks, uh, though he doesn't really check leg kicks himself. Though he um, though he pre- briefly got hurt by Li Jing Liang, uh, it, like oh, sorry, I should say though he rocked Li Jing, he did briefly get hurt by Li Jing Liang in that fight. So that's a little concerning. Uh, the clinch is another position that is really interesting between Kiesa and. Magni is a strength of both of them. Um, Magni's a very... So Kiesa uses the clinch more to find a takedown, where Magni uses the close quarters to make damage. He elbows, knees, he'll hit you with a shoulder. Like, he's he really worth it. You mentioned he's a good offensive wrestler, and he's greatly improved as a defensive wrestler. And that's because we talked about where Kiesa has good hip control. Magni has really started learning some hip control. Uh, though that says he still has a long area to go. He was taken brief, he was de- taken out briefly by Lee and Rocco Martin, and even Robbie Lowell at one point reversed the position on him while he was on top. Uh, which, if you have the same situation with Kiesa, you might have a hard time getting up on the bottom because he was able to get up very easily with those those three guys. As far as prediction, this is a really hard fight to pick a winner, but I think it's not really hard. To pick how it lays out, and what I, I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. I don't think there's many outcomes. To me, Magni should piece up Kiesa on the feet if it stays on the feet. Magni should do very well in, in the offense, if you know, in the clinch if he's on the offense, not if he's on the defense. But it really comes down to how well he does if he if he gets taken down and if he's able to get back up. If Kiesa gets takedowns on him, Magne, Magni would be in big trouble. So the question is, can Magni stop Kiesa's takedowns? And if so, can he get back up to his feet if he's taken down? I don't know that answer, which is why it's such a hard pick for me and so fascinating because I know that's the area I would be looking for. That said, I'm still taking the lower-ranked guy, and I'm actually picking Magni. Uh, Kiesa really only has that one position to win, while Magni has other areas – I don't know if Magni will win those areas, which is why it's so hard. However, Magni has looked so good recently. I think he's going to win a unanimous decision. I think he wins the early. I think the early rounds will be close, but I think as the battle as the fight goes deeper in, I think Magni will pick up some steam and win the the closer uh, the later rounds. So give me Magni by unanimous decision. And there you have it, picks for all fourteen fights from UFC Fight Island Eight. UFC on ESPN 20, UFC Fight Night, uh, Chiesa versus Magni, whatever you want to call it. We are done. A quick rundown of the picks. Uh, Victoria Leonardo versus Manon Fioro. Keith has Fioro by decision. Ben has Leonardo by decision. Umar Nurmagomedov versus Sergei Morozov. Keith has Nurmagomedov by third round submission. Ben has Nurmagomedov by decision. Mike Davis versus Mason Jones. Both of us have Davis by decision. Francisco Figueredo versus Jerome Rivera. Keith has Figueredo by decision. Ben has Rivera by round three submission. Dolce Lungiambula versus Marcus Perez. Both of us have Lungiambula by first round knockout. This is Keith's lock of the night. Sue Mudarji versus Zaruk Adashev. Keith has Mudarji by first round knockout. Ben has Mudarji by second round knockout. Ricky Simone versus Gaetano Perello. Ben has Simone by first round sub. Keith has Simone by second round sub. Omari Akhmedov versus Tom Brees. Keith has Akhmedov by second round knockout. Ben has Akhmedov by decision. Laurent Murphy versus Douglas Silva de Andrade. Keith has Murphy by decision. Ben has Murphy by round two knockout. Matt Schnell versus Tyson Nam. Ben has Nam by first round knockout. And this is his very ill-advised lock of the night. Keith has Schnell by decision. 
Roxanne Mataferi versus Viviane Araujo. Keith has Araujo by decision. Ben has Mataferi by decision in his upset special of the night. In the co-main event, Ike Villanueva versus Vinicius Moreira. Ben has Villanueva by first round knockout. Keith has Moreira by first round submission. And if the result is anything other than one of those two outcomes, we both have to take a drink. And in the headliner, Michael Chiesa versus Neil Magny. Ben has Chiesa by decision. Keith has Magny by decision. This is a midweek card, so we will do a brief recap of this card uh, right before we do the preview for UFC 257. So look for both of those to appear on the Sherdog Radio Network and the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network uh, overnight or first thing in the morning on Thursday. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy the fights. 